This is the sixth part of our series on God's purpose for the believer. And we're still on the subject of discipleship. And we're going to be thinking some more on the how of God's developing of the disciple. The all important way that God, the all important knowledge of the way of God, the way God works. <clears throat> how he does things. And we remember how that the Lord Jesus gave us the picture of the vine and the branches as to growth, where that we are to realize that we are but a branch in the Lord Jesus who is the true vine, that we receive his life, that our growth depends upon his life, and without him we can do nothing. <clears throat> and the Lord Jesus often uses uh, pictures, parables of nature to bring forth, set forth spiritual truths. That's what he did in using the picture of the branch and the vine. And he does it again concerning a grain of wheat. And we're going to think a little about this subject during this time together having to do more with service and we must remember that all true service is a result of uh, our life <clears throat> and the life of the Lord Jesus in and through us and the fact that his being free to minister through us brings about effective service not only in our sharing but in others receiving the fact the all important fact that others should be able to see something of him and uh, to learn something about him by knowing a Christian and being able to watch a Christian and to for them to make up their minds whether or not they feel that there is reality in the Lord Jesus. And this is very important that others are prepared. Then we are going to see a healthy birth, uh, true decisions for the Lord Jesus. We're going to see those who uh, become uh, babes in Christ become believers and uh, they go on to grow. They don't... Uh, fall back or amount to nothing or become misfits or we don't have to drag them on and force them and keep them propped up and all that's involved in an unhealthy birth. It's worth, well worth uh, waiting and making sure that the individual is prepared before we bring them to a decision. And if, as a matter of fact, when they are well prepared, there is very little effort involved on our part that they will be ready and they will reach out to him and respond to him so that our verse in Galatians 4 is extremely important where the Apostle Paul said that uh, my little children whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you that the Lord Jesus be manifest in the Christian that we might be more and more fully conformed to his image. That is the Christian life. And it is from that source that Christian service springs, evolves. Mr. Sparks said, uh, God will never put work or service in the place of character. And if we do that, eternity will reveal that however much we may have done, we are very small amongst the inhabitants of the land whose stature will be measured by the measure of Christ. It would be well if all who contemplate or are engaged in the work of God were governed by this one absolute final law that, both as to themselves and as to those amongst whom they minister, the ultimate test is not how much work is done, but how much of the Lord Jesus Christ is present or results from the ministry. 
And he also said, wrote that uh, devotion, utter devotion to God's purpose concerning his people is going to make the uttermost demand upon any servant of God. It is going to test and find out our spirit of service. And if we are going to serve God in this utter way, it is going to bring us to the point where we have nothing left to fall back upon, either a personal interest, position, or blessing. It is simply a matter of God and God only. If God does not do it, we are finished. We have nothing to live for. We have no alternative. We have no second line. We are in this matter of the Lord's purpose and interest to the very last drop of our blood. The purpose of God in his people will demand that. We shall find that sooner or later. It is no use. We cannot have any alternatives. We cannot have a second course. It is everything or nothing. And of course, that applies to discipleship. That applies to true service. That it must be the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. Not I, but Christ in every area of our Christian life and service. And then someone else has said, uh, let us not feel that our task is done with the salvation of a soul. The great burden of the Christian ministry should be that Christ may be formed in men, and that they in turn may be living witnesses to others. Notice Peter's words, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. But for what purpose has all this been accomplished? He goes on to say, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter 2.9 But ye are that ye should. First it is what we are, and then uh, the results of that will be the walk and the service that is honoring to him. We believe in Christ's power and desire to save, but for what? The whole purpose of salvation is that men may grow in the deeper stable characteristics of the Christian life. Yes, the whole purpose of salvation is that we might be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be those who abide in him, that we might be branches that are uh, receiving and manifesting the life of the true vine. Yes, life, the life of the Lord Jesus is primary. And service, which results from that, is secondary. And we don't want to get that twisted around, as uh, so many often do. And while we're talk talking about uh, service, it's important to see a distinction here. There's a very definite distinction between uh, witnessing and soul winning. And seeing and understanding this difference will save us a lot of trouble, will save us a lot of, um, keep us from doing harm to others in our service. If we look here in Acts 2:32, where we remember where Peter is preaching to the Jews on that great occasion. And he's setting forth the fact that the Lord Jesus is the Savior, the Christ, and that these Jews have crucified him, the very one that God has presented. And he says to them, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. He says here that they, the disciples are witnesses. They're witnessing to the fact that the Lord Jesus is the Savior. First comes the witness. And we are to be witnesses actually at all times. Sharing our testimony as the Lord enables and the right opportunity, the right time. And the fact that people are free to watch us as we grow in the Lord Jesus. That they might be able to see something of him in the life of the Christian that is uh, the everyday witness that actually is what is necessary to prepare hearts 
all should be witness to. But the witness is a preparation, and we are not to get down to the actual soul winning, bringing one to a decision until we see that the witness has prepared their hearts. Untold damage is being done by bringing people to a decision before they're ready, uh, that uh, seeking to get them saved before they know they're lost, and all of these things that causes so much damage. First, there is a witness, and that is for the preparation of the hearts. This Jesus hath God raised up, where, for whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the Jews heard this, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, they were convicted of their sin and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted of a sin. They were ready. They were reaching out. They were asking what to do. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Now when they heard this, when they heard the truth, then they responded, and not until then did Peter seek to bring them to a decision and tell them to repent. First the witness and then the actual soul winning. I remember so well years and years ago before I was saved. A dear brother in Wheaton began to seek me out to win me to Christ. But at the time I was not ready nowhere near ready. And uh, uh, he spoke to me time and time again. And actually, I didn't hear a word that he said. Not one word registered on my consciousness. Uh, none of the words got through my uh, through my ears, so to speak. I had ears, but I did not hear. And it was just like a stone wall. I uh, simply resisted. I was not ready. And finally, he realized this. And I remember one day he said to me, Well, I see you're not ready. And he ceased his um, seeking to bring me to Christ. But he didn't cease his praying. And he prayed all that summer. I, I didn't realize it at the time, but he was praying all that summer. I didn't know it. But it wasn't too long after that that I did uh, come under conviction of sin. I, I did uh, become aware that I was lost. I did begin to hunger to uh, be saved. And when I was ready, a uh, month later, I called him and asked him to come and help me and to show me in the Word how to be saved. I had already made up my mind that I was going to be on God's side, so to speak. I was not going to resist any longer. And then when he came and opened the Word and showed me John 3.16 and showed me what the Lord Jesus had done for me, I heard every word. I drank in every word. There was no resistance. I was ready. And the Lord saved me then and there. And there was never any question about it. And he, he put forth no effort whatsoever. He simply opened the Word, pointed me to the Savior in the Word, because there had been the preparation. Witnessing first and then the soul winning when the heart is ready. Sometimes uh, the heart might possibly be ready uh, very soon. Sometimes it may take years. And even if the heart is ready very soon, it's only because there has been work done in the past by someone else. So now if we can turn to John 12:24. We can um, look at a truth here, John 12:24 along this line. Certain Greeks came to Philip, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip told Jesus, who said uh, said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Well, here were prepared hearts, and they came to Philip, and they said they wanted to see the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the Savior. So Philip went to the Lord Jesus and told him this. And the Lord Jesus answered Philip and said to him, and he set forth his principle. He was telling, actually telling Philip what was going to happen to himself. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He was really telling him that he, as the the grain of wheat, would go to the cross and die and fall into the ground and die, and that he would rise again and bring forth fruit. That he, uh, there would be other grains of wheat, Christians, springing from him, growing from him. But at the same time, he was telling Philip that he, Philip, as a grain of wheat, must fall into the ground and die in behalf of these others if there were to be fruit. If there were those, uh, if there would be those who were brought to the Lord Jesus through him. And this is a principle that it must be not I, but Christ that we are, as disciples, the Lord Jesus will um, bury us as grains of wheat, and we will fall into the ground and die. And it will be not I, but Christ, and uh, the new life will rise in us, and the Lord Jesus will reach through us, and uh, he'll bring forth fruit. He'll bring forth other grains of wheat. There'll be a harvest. As we are kept out of the way, as we are buried in death, dying daily. We which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That type of uh, thing that we'll come in, uh, get into as we go along. As a grain of wheat, each Christian, and this is a principle of growth, and it's so important that we are ready and that we see the principles because it's so uh, reversed that uh, how can we ever live our Christian life, how can we ever serve the Lord Jesus if there's so much uh, death in the picture, if we're being taken down and uh, kept out of the picture. Uh, it's just the opposite of what we expect. Uh, but if, as we know the principle, as we realize how he works, we can uh, realize and see that, well, as self is held in the place of death and as I'm out of the picture, why, the Lord Jesus is free to minister in and through me. And others will be brought to him by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. This is the secret of effective service <clears throat> and effective life. Principle of growth. And we see this principle in uh, Luke 8, 8.15. Having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. And that's what the Christian needs is patience because God never works fast. Uh, the principle of growth, if, sure, if it's going to be a, a mushroom or something, it might grow up overnight, but uh, it'll fade just as quickly. But the eternal life, uh, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Christian development, it takes uh, all the life here and it takes all eternity. It takes time. It takes time and eternity. And we must realize this and be willing to uh, wait while there is the necessary development. In Mark 4.28, first the blade of uh, the little blade comes out of the ground and then the stalk, and finally the grain, the harvest time, but not until. And then God's attitude about it in James 5, 7. The husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it. Well, if God is willing to be patient, why not we? He, he, he realizes that it takes time. He's patient about it all. He's patient with all of our stubbornness, and all of our pride, and all, our, all of our resistance all of our slowness and uh, laziness. And God realizes, and he's willing to wait. He knows what it takes. And yet we're so impatient with him often, and we want to rush ahead and win a soul right away or grow and get out of a situation right away and become strong, powerful Christians overnight. No, no, there is a matter of growth, healthy, deep, abiding growth. And one of the reasons that God uh, teaches us this pace is so that we'll understand when we're dealing with others. That we will not seek to rush them on, force them and push them and ask them, what's the matter? Why aren't you developing? Why aren't you coming along? 
at least that it might be our attitude. No. We, as we see what it took for us, we're going to understand what it takes for others. There's going to be that understanding and that patience and that love and that concern and that willingness to wait. Uh, so many leaders today, especially in the so-called deeper life realm, are uh, seek to push the hungry heart, hold a week of meetings, for instance, or even a weekend of meetings. And by the end of the meetings, there is the exhortation and the pressure to enter into these truths and to make a commitment or something, consecration, when hearts are not anywhere near uh, prepared for this. And so many leaders forget that uh, it took them 20 and 30 years, possibly, and even when they were hungry-hearted, might even have been exceptions. And yet uh, they seem to forget so often and expect the average believer who may just be starting to become hungry or may not even be hungry yet. And yet uh, he's expected within a few days of uh, concentrated meetings, provided he's able to get out every night to each meeting, uh, he's expected to do something about it all right then and there. No, that's that uh, that causes a great amount of damage in hearts and in churches. Uh, general attitude toward the deeper truths is... Uh, wrong because of this. Many people are upset. They don't want to have any part of this because they're not ready for it. We must remember that it takes time. And in uh, our own development, we must remember that we are, each of us is a grain of wheat, that we have sprung from the Lord Jesus, we're abiding in Him, and that His life is our life, and He is the grain of wheat. And we are also grains of wheat with that same nature, that same life within. And we see ourselves as a nice, shiny, golden grain of wheat, matured. And we often, in our churches or wherever, we have fellowship with other grains of wheat, so to speak, we're uh, high up on the stalk in the group uh, cluster. We're very happy there, and we're basking in the sunlight, so to speak, with our shiny golden coats of testimony in our Christian life. And yet, even that doesn't satisfy. The Lord Jesus will not allow that to satisfy, because growth is not the goal. The harvest is the goal. And our verse says that except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. And in our lovely golden coat and our fellowship and our busyness, uh, there's a loneliness. The Holy Spirit will not allow us to be fulfilled in this. We're actually abiding alone. And of course, the nature of the grain of wheat life, the nature of our Christian life, is for fulfillment and for harvest, uh, for uh, bountiful harvest, for much fruit. That's the very nature and the hunger of that life. And it cannot abide alone. It cannot uh, stand it. And finally, we become uh, hungry to multiply and to see our life, the life of the Lord Jesus, uh, in others. That the nature of our life is seeking to go on to the 30, 60, and 100 fold. So that all that we thought we wanted, uh, being uh, growing and maturing Christians, happy Christians, Christians looked up to, Christians in the place of leadership, uh, is not, it does not satisfy. And we begin to hunger and to long for to be made fruitful, to bring forth fruit that abides. Uh, we're hungering to fulfill our lives. And we're not satisfied to abide alone. And all of this hunger uh, prepares us for what lies ahead, for what is necessary, for the harvest. So that we begin to yearn and to look to the Lord Jesus for fulfillment in our lives. And then we begin to hear him say that except the grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die... It bringeth forth much fruit. And we see that our discipleship, if we're going to follow him and be uh, matured 
and bring forth fruit, we realize that it is going to involve death. It's going to involve the cross. And we've heard him say, now we are to take up our cross and follow him. And we are beginning to realize that the cross involves death, daily death. But our hunger of heart causes us to be willing for this. And uh, we realize that we're uh, abiding alone, actually. And we're lonely. We're hungry for others. The seed corn may be beautiful, but it is hard. The germ of life is locked up within its shell and cannot get out. Therefore, it produces nothing. Here is the reason why so many Christians, even preachers, are so unfruitful. Only one here and there is a soul winner. When a grain of wheat is buried, it dies, and that hard exterior surface decays and softens in order to give nutriment to the young sprout, which would otherwise die and thus cause a crop failure. One must reckon himself dead to the hard, cold, selfish eye before the softening influence of the Holy Spirit can operate, qualifying the believer in the service of God. Many want to do God's work but are unable because of the flesh in their lives. And then this further thought, we often come across Christians who are bright and clever and strong and righteous, in fact, a little too bright and a little too clever. There seems so much of self in their strength, and their righteousness is severe and critical. They have everything to make them saints except crucifixion, which would mold them into a supernatural tenderness and limitless charity for others. But if they are of the real elect, God has a wine press prepared for them, through which they will someday pass which will turn the metallic hardness of their nature into gentle love, which Christ always brings forth at the last of the feast. And this is the process that he will carry out when we begin to hunger to bring forth much fruit. And we remember how we have mentioned the means and the how of his processing, that he uses uh, our home life, our family life, and uh, at work or at school. He will use uh, our very closest ones to strip us down and to prepare us for his processing, the death that uh, the harvest might come through the corn of wheat falling into the ground and dying. For instance, if uh, you are a lady and you're walking along the street and some stranger across the street street should uh, call over and say something that would insult you and hurt you, uh, you'd feel very badly about that. But still, it would still be someone you didn't know. It would be more or less objective. It would only hurt to a certain extent. But yet, when one something happens in one's family with one's loved ones, one's husband or wife, for instance, uh, says something or does something that cuts and hurts, uh, this is much more effective in its effect upon us because it's one who is so close. So it's a personal thing, much more effective. And God uses these things to deal with us in our home life. For instance, things happen that show us uh, what we really are we say things or do things and we're shown up for what we really are. We see something of self in a very intimate, a very close relationship. And so that that's much more effective. It has much more of an effect upon us. But it's God doing these things. It's God working this out to prepare us and to bring us down. To make us nothing so that the Lord Jesus might be our everything. And if we can turn to Matthew 13, 37, we can see something of his principle, the way he works in bringing forth the much fruit from the grain of wheat, the Christian who is the grain of wheat. Matthew 13, 37. And he's still speaking in parables here. He's, speak, he's drawing pictures of uh, wheat to bring out this uh, principle, this truth. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, 
The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. What a picture this is. That the Lord Jesus is a man sowing good seed in his field. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man, is the Lord Jesus. And the field is the world. That's his field, the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, true, that verse, and that, that means the, doesn't mean the world as a globe, but it means uh, all in the world. God so loved the world. And the Lord Jesus' uh, field is the, the world, all in the world. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom. And here the Lord Jesus is seeking to sow Christians. He's sowing the seed in the world. And he's going to take the uh, grain of wheat that is hungry to come to harvest and to be multiplied. And when he's ready, God is going, the Lord Jesus is going to sow him. He's going to drop him into the ground. It might be in his home. It might be at work. It might be on the mission field. It might be in the ministry. Wherever it might be, when he's ready, the Lord Jesus is going to sow him then and there put him in a situation where he's brought down to death, all the way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. And he's going to be made nothing. He's going to be held out of sight, so to speak, where there will be fruit. In Mark 8, he says, He that loseth his life for my sake and the gospel shall keep it unto life eternal. And he also calls upon us to hate our life. And the Christian who has been struggling and failing and finding out something of what self is like, he begins to hate his self-life, the old nature. He begins to hate sin, of course. And he wants to get free from this old life. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? So that he's able to hate his life and love the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, his new life. So he's willing to lose his life for the sake of the Lord Jesus and for the gospel. He's willing to be sown in the situation and circumstances sown and uh, fall down to the ground and die. He's willing for that. He's glad to lose this old life. Because out of this death will arise the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus and out of this death will arise uh, the fruit in the lives of others. And his life will be fulfilled and of course the Lord Jesus will see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied in that grain of wheat because it will be brought to harvest. And so many Christians, when they're hungry and reaching out, the, the Lord Jesus sows them in a certain situation and they don't realize what's happening. They, they seek to get out of that situation. They seek to keep from being buried and they're trying to save their life. And, of course, they lose out that way. There's no fruit. No, that's why we must be prepared. That's why we must know what he's doing so that we'll hold still and allow him to plant us here and there or here or there, whatever the case might be. And we realize what he's doing. We think of this piece of poetry here. Except it fall into the ground and die, can much fruit come alone at such a cost? Must the seed corn be buried in the earth, all summer joy and glory seeming lost? He buries still his seed corns here and there, and calls to deeper fellowship with him, those who will dare to share the bitter cup. And yet while sharing, sing the triumph hymn. Except it fall into the ground and die, but what a harvest in the days to come, when fields stand thick with golden sheaves of corn and you are sharing in the harvest home. To you who lose your life and let it die, yet in the losing find your life anew, Christ evermore unveils his lovely face, and thus his mirrored glory rests on you. Yes, he's seeking to sow the Christian in the world, wherever it might be. He knows. He has his place. He is conditioning the heart for the work that he has. And this uh, bright, shiny testimony, this golden coat that the Christian has been so proud of, possibly, when he is brought into the situation of death, this and buried in the ground, so to speak, this shiny golden coat begins to disintegrate, and the Christian, uh, for a time, loses his testimony, and he just uh, can't seem to hold up his end, so to speak. And he's all upset because it seems as though he's losing out completely. 
whereas it's simply the normal process. And each time the Lord brings us onto a new plane, into further into the deeper truths, it's just as though he's doing everything all over again, but he's not really. It is as though we've come to the end of ourselves and we just can't go on. But all that is in the past is still there, and he's building upon it. Nothing is ever lost. Although at the time, during the process, it seems like all is lost. But no, he never wastes a thing. When he builds something in, it's built in forever. But the new plateau, the new plane to which he is bringing us, necessitates uh, much of the same process, but it's on a different plane. It's in a different area of the life. But it's the same principle, down with self, up with the Lord Jesus. Death to us, life for him. His mirrored glory rests on you. We remember our Second Corinthians verse, uh, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That is our principle. As he buries us, as he plants us, we just continue to look to him. We're able to trust him. We're able to rest in him. We're able to say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That is the preparation needed for discipleship, because discipleship is going to involve the cross. It's going to involve death. And when we take up our cross and follow him, it's going to mean uh, this um, fact of all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And the next verse, the twelfth verse of Second Corinthians 4, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. And as the Christian, as the work of the cross in the life of the Christian deals with the old life and holds it more and more fully in the place of death, inoperative, out of commission, uh, death is working in the Christian. He's planted in death. And the result of that death, the not I, uh, means the Lord Jesus, the life of the Lord Jesus, uh, reaching out through us, so to speak, and it's life in others, life in you. That others will have life because of our being dealt with in discipleship. The cross in our lives is going to bring life to others because it brings death to us. Death to our old life. And that uh, we can begin to experience more fully the life of the Lord Jesus. So that this verse in Second Corinthians 4, verses 11 and 12, are all important. They, they just uh, involve the entire picture of Christian life and service. The entire principle of uh, the corn of wheat falling into the ground and dying. And if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, here and now, in our mortal flesh, so that death worketh in us, but life in you. We which live, it's a paradox again. The Christian is the only one who is living. He, he alone has life. All others are dead to God. We which live are always delivered unto death. That wonderful paradox of God that he'll take uh, the living Christian down into death so that the, the resurrection life might spring out of that death. We must remember then our parable in Matthew 13. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. And when we're ready, when we're hungry, when we're reaching out to that there might be fruit from our lives, the result will be he will sow us in a specific situation that he has prepared. We must be prepared for this in our attitude and be willing. 
He that loseth his life for my sake and the gospel shall keep it unto life eternal. And that's what he's waiting for. That's the end to which he's working with us. That's why the things are happening to us, so many things that we don't understand, wonder what's wrong. It's the all things that are working together for good uh, for the Christian. It's all pointed to this process of death. The resurrection life springs out of death. As self is held in the place of death, the new life, the life of the Lord Jesus, the Christian life, will develop and grow and bring forth the much fruit that we hunger for and that he hungers for. I remember when I was first saved, it wasn't too long after I was saved that I went into the service World War One, and was overseas in Europe about two years and uh, so young in the Lord and so eager and aggressive and in a uh, close intimate relationship with uh, the others in my outfit in the army and the engineers through these years every day all day day and night so that it was a wonderful opportunity for witnessing and it was uh, also a wonderful opportunity to find out how not to do it and to find out and to realize and come to realize and come to see that uh, I had to grow in Christ and that he had to be seen in me and it wasn't just my cornering these fellows and seeking to win them to him and uh, forcing them to a decision and all that we do so in our early years I went through all that but in spite of me, the Lord Jesus did uh, win a number in the service. But yet when I came out of the service and had come to realize how important growth was, it come out of the engineers, the army, and had come to realize what was something of what was involved in growth, then it was for years that I studied and concentrated upon growth, keeping service in the secondary position until God would uh, develop me further. And there was many, many years of uh, concentrated study and finding out about myself and waiting upon Him and finding out about Him, learning something of Him, and then uh, quietly and effortlessly and normally and naturally uh, he began to bring me into uh, full-time service. He began to fit me into the work that he had planned for me. And it was all very normal and natural and uh, simple and uh, just foregone conclusion it seemed. It was so uh, well prepared. Now, if your heart is hungry, if you have been reaching out to him for development, then it, one must not be surprised if there is, let's say, a negative reaction, that things begin to happen in a downward course. This uh, the hungry heart must be prepared for. This picture must be seen. Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. That the result of the Christian's heart hunger is going to mean death to self. Often uh, the thinking is that, well, if I'm going to be a disciple of his and begin to follow him uh, truly, everything's going to be wonderful. He's going to use me. He's going to 
uh, do all sorts of things through me and I'm going to be a very valuable Christian. But yet it's, it's exactly the opposite. That uh, fellowship involves a cross, a grain of wheat being sown involves death, disintegration. All that we thought we had, uh, we're going to lose. All of our strong points are going to become our weakest points. And all of our weak points are going to be made manifest. And that shiny golden coat of the grain of wheat is going to become green and uh, moldy. It's going to crack open and there's going to be death. There's going to be loss of testimony, as a matter of fact. Things are going to happen to the Christian where he's going to be made just nothing. There's going to be misunderstanding that he's not going to be able to explain. He's going to lose his uh, reputation. All sorts of death is going to take hold of him. And self is going to be dealt with very definitely. And the Christian will never, never hold still in this process unless he sees what God is doing and understands and is uh, prepared and willing. Never. He's going to struggle and uh, get out of this situation unless he sees what God is doing. He's going to completely... He's going to be completely frustrated. He's never going to be able to cooperate with God in his process unless he understands and sees, unless he's ready and willing. And God uh, is willing to wait until the heart is prepared. So we must remember what's going to happen when we reach out to him and follow him. Our Father, we thank thee for the clarity of thy word, how carefully thou hast set forth thy principles. We pray that we might be real students and...